All right, what's up? Welcome everybody to today's webinar. I am here with principal and founder of the JCAM Alternative Investments Fund, Jack Krupe. I am William Bonatti, partner in the JCAM Fund and will be your host today. Uh, we'll be doing an overview on the fund's strategy and providing a brief update on the current investments in the fund, which total six multifamily projects with over 1,200 doors across six emerging markets in five states. Uh, we do welcome any questions you may have, and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. So let's go ahead and uh, jump into the agenda for today. Um, many of you already know us, but for, for those of you that are new, we'll be doing a brief introduction. Uh, then we'll cover the fund strategy, our process, the diversified fund, the asset allocation, and we'll talk about the current fund assets and any updates on those. Then we'll briefly touch on the tax benefits from participating in the fund and then lastly finish up with how to learn more and then open it up to any questions or feedback you all may have. So why don't we go ahead and uh, jump right in. And so for those of you who don't know me, I am William Bonatti. I grew up in Colorado and got a degree in finance and real estate from Colorado State University. Uh, right out of college, I got the Series 7, 66, Life and Health, and started my career at a big uh, insurance company, and then transitioned into banking, working as a financial specialist, uh, financial consultant, uh, was there for three, four years, and then uh, transitioned into a financial advisor role, and then ultimately transitioned into a more entrepreneurial career path uh, by starting to invest in, in real estate, and I started out like a lot of people do uh, by wholesaling. Then I started flipping houses and then I started investing in non-performing loans uh, because this was scalable and something that I could do remotely um, because my wife and I were moving pretty much every three to four years for her medical training. So we were all over the East Coast. And while I was in New York City in 2014, I connected with Jack Krupe and then ultimately joined his his team at his previous fund to run uh, the NPL Dispositions Trade Desk there. Uh, I was there for two years and then Jack and I uh, both left that fund uh, and then have partnered up again uh, with his current fund. And so my family and I currently live in the Vale Valley, which many of you may know of or visit from time to time. So, you know, if you're ever out this way, uh, make sure you let me know. Don't come here and not let me know. Uh, and I'll show you some good, uh, some great powder stashes or, or maybe take you to a local fishing spot. So um, that's it on me. Uh, most of you know Jack or know of Jack because of his, his reputation and me meteoric rise uh, in the business. But for those of you who don't know him, uh, Jack, why don't, you, why don't you bring us up to speed on, on your story? Sure, sure. Thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, so I've been uh, in real estate since 2001. I graduated uh, undergrad from Rochester Institute of Technology, the degree in information technology, but uh, um, getting out of school in 2001 was sort of not the greatest time to be in technology, but it was actually a really good time to uh, get into real estate. So I um, was uh, fortunate to uh, befriend my uh, landlord in college and he helped me uh, get started, uh, bought a number of two family houses in Rochester, New York, uh, and uh, really did everything in the traditional real estate. I was uh, ended up uh, getting my broker's license. I was flipping houses, I was wholesaling, I had a rental portfolio um, and uh, you know, had a had an interesting run until 2008. Um, you know, when, uh, when the financial crisis happened, uh, had a uh, opportunity to um, uh, work at a private equity fund that was buying non-performing loans. Uh, this was December, 2008, uh, the height of the financial crisis. So yeah. Um, it was an interesting time to be uh, in New York on, on Wall Street. Um, so I uh, learned that business, uh, was there, there at the firm for about two years, and then went on my own and started buying loans from a number of other hedge funds, uh, partnered with a, a small family office in New York. And then we ended up partnering with a larger private equity fund. And um, you know, between 2014 and uh, 2019, bought over $2 billion in non-performing and re-performing loans. And obviously that's where, uh, where we work together. Um, that whole time, or at least the last few years of that, I wasn't allowed to buy loans on my own. So for, for my personal investing, I started uh, 
looking to buying apartment buildings. I knew a few operators that were, uh, you know, buying larger buildings. And after being uh, being a landlord myself in the early days, um, you know, I, I've found that it's actually in many cases easier and less risky to have a larger building, uh, you know, 150 unit building, you still have one roof, one, uh, you know, one furnace, not 150 roofs, 150 basements that can flood. Um, and it's, it's, it's more like owning a business than being a landlord and having, um, you know, getting calls at two in the morning for broken tenants, you know, for broken toilets, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so really this fund launched out of really what I sort of had a need for personally. And, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, really challenged with having to figure out which deal to invest in. I didn't have, you know, far from an unlimited amount of capital and deciding between putting 50, 100,000 into a deal in Texas versus a deal in South Carolina versus a deal in Georgia um, was very challenging for me. So I wanted to uh, uh, offer a product that had more diversification um, and uh, make that available to, to our network of investors. So, uh, you know, we, we've achieved that. We have diversification across multiple markets and multiple properties. Um, we, we see a fair amount of off-market deal flow from, uh, from very strong uh, operators we have a history with. and. Uh, uh, the taxes are uh, an, an extremely, extremely important factor uh, in, in the returns. And it's something that for, uh, for, for most high income earning people in high tax states, it's really a game changer. Yeah, yeah. This fund makes a lot of sense uh, for those that are passive and, and want exposure to some tax benefits and uh, diversification. So let's talk uh, briefly about um, why uh, you should invest uh, with, with JCAM Alternative Investments. And, and there are really three major reasons. Um, the first is with our experience and expertise, you can participate in quality, stable, risk adverse projects that like Jack said, are typically hard to source if you're, if you're not in the industry. The second major reason is the diversification you get in our fund. For example, you get exposure to many sponsors or operators, projects, uh, diverse geographies, and asset classes, which provide a great balance of current cash flow and also uh, upside potential. Uh, and then the last and third uh, major reason is by participating in, your fund, in our fund, you'll receive a higher preferred return lower management fees and a percentage of the of the carried interest, which, you know, is difficult to achieve by investing directly into to one single project. So, so Jack, why don't you speak a little to the due diligence that we do when evaluating uh, a project sponsor? Sure. So, um, you know, some of these sponsors I've known a number of years already. So some, some of uh, some of these things happened, you know, five to 10 years ago with certain certain sponsors. Um, at the same time, as we grow and as projects cross our desk, uh, you know, we, we do uh, uh, evaluate and, and take our time to get to know any possible new sponsors. So, um, you know, it involves meeting multiple times. Um, you know, I flew to Lexington, Kentucky myself in the beginning of January to walk the property. Um, you know, so we review their track record, um, review the property, the budgets, uh, you know, the overall story. Um, you know, the, the one thing to point out is it, it is a very competitive market and, uh, you know, often uh, groups are looking at 100 deals before they even bring one to us uh, because they're, they're, they're either just overpriced or there's not enough upside potential in the value add or, right. or it's just uh, or they just, you know, lose the competitive bid. Um, you know, some of the better deals are completely off market where they you know, the sponsors have a have a relationship with a seller. And um, you know that those are sometimes the, the the best deals that aren't listed through a brokerage where everybody's bidding on them. And uh, you know we do independent research. We're able to pull comparable sales, look at comparable rents. Uh, you know, in many cases, if we're on site, we'll also go look at the competing competing properties. And uh, you know, if the if the plan is to do a value add and raise the rents by hundred dollars, uh, you know, we'll we'll sometimes tour tour the neighboring property and see what the neighbor's property rents for. That's a hundred dollars more expensive, and make sure that we see a path to that right and um, you know we're in we're in regular communication with with sponsors because we're often uh you know an integral part of their their capital raise so um you know we're constantly uh you know staying in touch with them on what future deals they may have in the pipeline and how they're doing uh pulling together the capital for their current deal right yeah most of the sponsors or operators that we're working with are, are, are longer term strategic relationships that we have so uh the communication is pretty frequent so let's talk a little bit about the, the asset allocation on the fund. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the one of the major benefits to our fund is a diversification uh, in the assets, uh, and the overall fund allocation looks like this. So, 50% uh, of the fund will be in stable multifamily value add type projects that are fully occupied and have positive cash flow. So that provides a nice foundation or, or base for the fund. Um, 25% will be in higher upside. Uh, ground up development projects like senior housing, um, which typically don't have any cash flow for the first couple of years, but the uh, the IRRs are higher because it is uh, ground up construction. And then the last 25% there will be again in higher upside transactions like non-performing loans, REOs, and potentially some bridge or hard money lending. So again, uh, here you see the asset classes. One of the asset classes not shown here is mobile home parks, uh, which we're evaluating due to their significant tax advantages. Um, and Jack, maybe you want to talk a little bit about this asset class and the uh, the loan REO pool that we, we recently acquired. Uh, yeah, so this was a, a deal that was a, a long-term relationship that uh, that I've had, a group I've done business with since probably 2008. And uh, they had an old LLC that had a few remaining uh, properties and loans in it. So um, a number of the loans have been paying uh, for seven years on a payment plan uh, that at one point in the past, you know, soon after 2008, had, they had some financial problems, but these... Uh, uh, borrowers were, you know, in a long-term repayment plan, um, paid for multiple years. Um, so we bought a combination of cash flowing loans and then a few that were still non-performing and then due to COVID were sort of just in limbo. Um, but uh, overall we bought, you know, the cash flowing portion of the portfolio is, uh, you know, over a 15% cash on cash return. And, um, you know, a number of the other distressed loans we bought for 20, 30 cents on the dollar. So it was a very attractive deal. Um, the seller was willing to sell it to us because it was just the last remaining assets and they were a little bit esoteric and that's part of our experience is to be able to understand these niche niche assets and value them and, and, and work through them. Right. Um, yeah, so this is a good, that's a good example, Jack, um, for everyone on, on the loan acquisition asset class. So um, the next one is the, uh, the senior housing uh, ground up development and then also looking at uh, an opportunity in, in Delray. Jack, you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so the senior housing is a very established group that's built over 20 facilities. Um, it's in the Midwest. Uh, this, the next deal is going to be in Davenport, Iowa. And it's, it's a cookie cutter. They build almost the same building in every market, roughly 120 beds uh, with a combination of, uh, of assisted living, memory care, and you know skilled nursing. Uh, they use a third-party operator and uh, generally doing roughly 30% uh, overall IRRs. Um, it's, we're going to make a small allocation, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 150,000 just to have some exposure to the asset class, and we're likely to participate with them on future deals. Right. Um, you know, and, and the fact that we have the cash flow from all the multifamilies allows us to, uh, you know, to do certain investments in these deals that have much higher returns. Um, the other project is actually with. Guardian, which is the same sponsor that uh, owns and operates the Augusta, Georgia deal. Um, you know, they they have been building ground up for close to 20 years and uh, also do these do multifamily because it's, you know, as as uh, as the CEO has described, he could do multifamily in his sleep when you could build ground up. So yeah, um, renovating, renovating apartments is simple when you're used to building ground up. So um, Delray Beach, Florida is near near Jupiter, near Palm Beach. It's a, a really growing market there's 11 townhomes um it's uh, as of right so there's no zoning approval needed um just basic building permits and uh three of the um three of the units are uh, already potentially uh under under contract as as pre-construction so yeah um that that really uh, um yeah makes this project uh very uh very compelling yeah, frankly absolutely. it's not even going to be a public raise it's just because we're already invested in other people it's only going to go to a couple groups so it's a truly off-market opportunity yeah so a couple great examples of what uh ground up uh, that ground up asset class looks like in our fund um so jack why don't you talk a little bit about the the multifamily uh asset class sure and, and this is you know this is the the you know the main core you know, 50% of the fund, and it's what we, which, with our first five investments were, uh, we're in multifamily, uh, generally 100 units plus, 
and uh, generally with a value add component. Um, that means these assets are mostly already what I'd call somewhat stabilized. Um, generally, the occupancy has been 90 to 95 percent, so they're not truly distressed. They're you know they're cash flowing and they're profitable. Um, but by by improving and renovating the units as they become vacant, you can uh, increase uh, increase the rents and thus increase the uh, the value uh, value of the buildings. Um, we generally focus on Class B, which uh, I think we go into in more yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me talk a little bit about that. Right. So uh, there are really three major types of property classes, and 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 Jake, the J Camp Fund is really focused on Class B, which is in the middle and we like this class because the occupancy is stable through market cycles whether that's up or down so class a is typically new luxury type properties class b is typically 20 to 30 years old and has you know has strong demand and class c are older buildings in areas with you know higher crime lower uh employment rates um you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and this includes low income type housing um so the class, you know, with class B being in the middle, uh, regardless of the economic cycle, there is demand from either side, you know. So for example, in recessions, people are moving out of class A into, into class B and vice versa. In booms, people are moving up out of class C into class B. So, uh, you know, the, the demand is always really strong uh, for class B and, and we've seen that with the occupancy rates even you know through a pandemic so uh, Jack why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what exactly multifamily value is like what's the strategy there sure so uh, you know a majority of these uh, acquisitions were built in the 70s or 80s so uh, often they're in areas where there's not uh, a lot of room for new construction and we're acquiring these at a substantial discount to what uh, replacement cost would be to build to build these new um, and um, you know, again, generally we're looking for properties that have a, a, a way to improve the value. Um, you know, there's a nice little before and after picture on the on the on the screen here, and and that's that's that really just demonstrates. You know, there's uh, there's nothing terrible about the one on the left. It's just old and dated. <laughs> I don't know. That looks pretty terrible. <laughs> Well, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Good. Yeah, it's uh, in, in addition to you know the interior units, where in some cases we're spending you know might be on the low end three thousand, on the high end sometimes ten thousand per unit. You know, renovating kitchens and bathrooms, um, and then adding uh, um, you know amenities too, um, things like uh, you know laundry hookups, things like uh, you know even dog parks, uh, a gym. Uh, there's a lot of efficiencies that uh, that can be added. Um, in some cases, if a building has been family managed, sometimes they have, um, you know, units where people are living for free. Um, sometimes the, uh, the uh, leasing center is in a two bedroom apartment that uh, in, in reality, the leasing center could be in a, you know, in a, in a one bedroom or it can just be an external. Yeah, you know, offsite. So, yeah, so there's a lot of things that uh, can be done to improve the, uh, you know, a increase rents over time, and then improve ultimately just improve the the efficiency of, of, of these operations, especially when you're buying from a family run or or, uh, or just an, an owner who's owned it a long time and bought it. You know, if somebody bought it 20 years ago, their basis is really low, and they just don't have to run it as efficiently as efficiently. Right, and 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 it's not listed here, but there's some other other stuff that's um, can provide efficiencies like energy efficiencies, so LED lighting. Um, you know, some water fixture upgrades, um, even billing efficiency, uh, we found to, to be able to, to find some hidden value in just the way the billing is done. So um, there's a lot of uh, stuff that you can do with um, the multifamily value add to, to create, um, you know, increased, increased operating income. So great. So let's talk uh, briefly about um, the, the funds investments so far. So like I mentioned before, we've got six multifamily projects, which you can see here are in uh, some diverse geographies. Ultimately, the fund will likely make investments into uh, as many as 15 different multifamily projects. Um, and so why don't we just run through each one of these real quick and do a high level overview and, and then we'll talk about any updates on the on the current projects while we're going through it. So, so the Augusta 
GA project is 104 units. It provides a 7 to 9% cash on cash return and has a projected 19% IRR over five years and a 2.2x multiple. Um, this one has been, been great so far. So Jack, why don't you give us the update on this project? Sure. So this was actually our first uh, our, our first investment that was uh, at the end of September, the first week of October, um, and performing nine percent above uh, initial uh, initial projections so far. Um, there's uh, plenty of cash in reserve to finish the uh, remainder of improvements. That was all that was all raised up front, and uh, you know we expect to be you know at or under budget there. Um, we uh, we got back the cost segregation analysis, and uh, you know we've we've put out some uh, some blog content and, and uh, talked about this in other other posts. Uh, um, so we won't go into too much detail, but um, for every thousand invested, we're getting a seven hundred dollar loss tax loss. Now that's a paper loss. We're still going to receive our preferred return, and the overall investment's trending to a high teens overall internal rate of return, but. Um, for this year, we're going to get a significant K-1 loss, and then that K-1 loss actually gets passed through to uh, to our investors. Um, the first distribution on uh, this deal is expected to be in June. Some of our other projects started making distributions um, right away. It kind of depends on the operator and how how much value add. Uh, but all in all, this one's performing very well. Um, the market uh, the market is still growing, uh, as is most of the Southeast, and uh, you know, we're expecting. Uh, this one to continue to, to be a great uh, yeah. cash cow for us. Yeah, really great project. So Jack, you touched briefly on uh, the depreciation and tax benefits. Why don't you just elaborate a little yeah. bit on that? We don't want to get into too much detail. But, sure. Uh, sure. So uh, yeah, so it's an engineering study that gets done and, and typically on a, on a residential building, including multifamily, typically you would depreciate over 27 and a half years, um, just the value of the building. So you have to subtract the land and uh, you know, generally, if you just own a two-family house, you know it's enough to offset a good chunk of your, uh, your your rental income. But on assets that are worth you know multi-million dollars, you you pay for this study, and they take a look at everything, including the fixtures, the cabinets, the the heating and air conditioning systems, and they look at the, the true life of of those those improvements, and they're able to accelerate some of them over 15 years, some of them over five years. Um, and some of them uh, with bonus depreciation, which uh, was a tax change in 2017. Anything that was less than anything less than 15 years can be taken in the first year. So that's that's why we're getting these significant first year uh, first year depreciation benefits. Now uh, we're looking at a few mobile home park deals now. Um, generally, as part of a larger larger fund, where we'll have a piece of 20 or 30 mobile home parks, as opposed to owning an individual one, just for for again, for diversification, and uh, in some in some cases, those investments will be a hundred percent. Literally, every every dollar we put in, will be a tax loss that year. Yeah, um, huge. <clears throat> yeah. So again, uh, that that all passes through to the uh, the investors in our fund. Um, I yeah, you know, we can't quote exactly dollar for dollar what an investor will get because it also it depends on how many investors end up in the fund uh, at the end of the year and what time of the year people come in. Um, but being early in the year is is better because. Uh, uh, part of the calculation is sort of is prorated by the time the time of the year someone comes into the fund versus you know someone coming into the fund next month versus came in December. Um, the calculation changes, but either way, it's significant. It, it should far exceed the preferred return that we pay. So uh, you know, paying a six or an eight percent or you know preferred return, you're going to get enough of a loss that your preferred return is completely tax deferred. And if you have yeah. other rental yeah. properties, or if you're a real estate professional. Uh, there's uh, there's a good chance it could offset some of your other passive income. Yeah, great. So some really good tax uh, tax benefits to, to being in the fund. Uh, so the next project uh, is in Phoenix, Arizona. It's 288 unit building with an 8% cash on cash projected 15 to 18 IRR over three years with a, a 1.5 to 1.7 X multiple. So um, Jack, why don't you give us the update on this one? Uh, sure, uh, they, their their occupancy is at uh, 95.83%. Um, uh, their income, their net operating income, is 22 22% higher than uh, than budgeted, and um, the renovated units are renting for $262 more than the pr prior un unrenovated units. Yeah. So uh, you know, this is again, Phoenix is is booming. Uh, I think they're taking advantage of a lot of. There was already a flow of people moving from California uh, you know, to 
to Phoenix and Las Vegas. And I think COVID, uh, you know, actually yeah, accelerated that. that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that along with the taxes. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, uh, we're, we're very excited about this one. Uh, Phoenix is actually targeted to be, uh, be a three-year hold. So some of these projects are five to seven years, but this one, the, the business plan on this one all along is to uh, renovate as many units as possible, increase, increase the rents and then sell. Um, so, you know, this is one of the projects that if it continues, will be one of the ones that will likely be the, the first, first large return of capital. Yeah. Um, we've been targeting invest, telling investors that, you know, between year three and five, we're, we're hoping to return all of the money and then just harvest the profits for a few years. So, um, yeah. it's very good news that this one's moving in the direction it is yeah. so well, yeah. so quickly. Yeah. Perfect. So Jacksonville, Florida project is a 284 unit property with a 10 to 11% cash on cash. Uh, with a 14% plus projected IRR over five years with a 1.9x multiple. Um, there haven't been any updates on this project performance, but we are expecting that in the near term. Uh, we did get a distribution though. They did send their quarter four distribution. Uh, they started paying right away just because it's stabilized assets. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, we are waiting the formal update on sort of the operational yeah. side. Of things. Yeah. So the next one, the next project we'll, we'll talk about is the Greenville, South Carolina uh, project. Again, it's a 144 unit property with an 8% cash on cash, a 16.3% IRR over five years and a 1.95x multiple. Um, again, Jack, why don't you give us, uh, give us the update on, on this one? Uh, sure. Yeah. So they've, uh, you know, they've got the building 88% occupied. Um, they've got 91% if you count the uh, pre-leased units where people are going to be moving in in the next month. And, uh, you know, interesting fact here, and you know, we talked about some of the value adds in the earlier slides, but there's also some financial sort of financial engineering that can help. Um, so they have a, you know, a, an agreement with a, uh, a security deposit vendor that, uh, you know, offers tenants the ability to to move in with a with a lower security deposit and uh you know often and i don't know all the financial details but often there's a you know a revenue share uh with with the vendor for that for giving them exclusivity um so it's another way to uh you know to just make the efficient make the uh rentals more efficient um sometimes they can do that with bundling cable um internet services as well with, with vendors so um you know moving along as planned and um yeah. and this was this was a deal that closed late december so um you know they're they're they're, they're going to make their first uh, distribution you know late late february once there's a couple months of operations yeah great awesome so uh next project uh, the atlanta uh, ga project is a 150 unit property with a, an 11 percent cash on cash 17 percent irr over five years and a one point 9x multiple and this project carries carries with it uh, a significant tax depreciation benefit um, jack again why don't you share the update on this one huh uh, sure so again this one was uh this one was bought late last year um it's already 100 percent occupied so there, there's going to be some interior and exterior innovations obviously we're not uh you know that we're managing the property in, in an as efficient way as possible so uh, when leases come up the decision is going to be made do, do we uh just you know bump the rent 25 or 50 dollars or do we bump the rent more and sort of you know push it closer to market and, and or decide if we're going to vacate the unit renovate it and increase the rents um you know atlanta's again a, a booming market and um you know this particular operator um, you know, is uh, based in Tampa, but they're you know, basically that whole within a couple hundred miles of that region. That's they're they're one of the major players. So um, they often get the first call if there's a building that's uh, coming to market. Uh, some you know they get off market deals uh, you know, very often because they're a known uh, a known commodity in the market. Yeah, um, we're actually going to um, see a, a new deal uh, from them shortly where they own the building down the street. And uh, so one of our, likely one of our new investments in the coming months will be a deal where they already own the one down the street and they got a call from the seller and it's a true off market deal because the seller knows they'll close because they own the one yeah. down the street. And that's going to help the value of both buildings because when they sell, you could actually package them together and get a higher price because at, at that scale, a larger institutional buyer may buy the properties. Yeah. Awesome. And let's talk a little bit about uh, the most recent one here uh, was an allocation to the Lexington, K Kentucky project, which is a 314 unit building with a 10% cash on cash, 
a 25% IRR over eight years and a one and a half to two X multiple. Um, yeah, this so, one this I'm pretty excited about. And again, you know, I flew, I, I, I flew to Lexington beginning of January, walked it personally. Um, the photo you can see here, there's a, an indoor pool, uh, indoor heated pool uh, in that, which is a great amenity for, for a property. And, um, you know, the, the cool thing about this one, and it's something that's going to be, uh, you know, I think a, a bigger focus in the fund uh, as we grow is, uh, you know, by, by bringing capital in from multiple investors and investing as a, as a fund, um, we're able to, to, in many cases, get better terms. So, um, you know, we call it a co-GP or shared GP model where yeah. if we're able to bring enough money to the table that it moves the needle for for the sponsor or JV partner, we can get a piece, our investors can get a piece of the general partner side, which can increase returns by multiple percentage points. So, um, you know, if an investor is thinking of putting 50 or 100,000 directly into a deal, um, often if they put 50 to 100,000 with our fund, they'll they'll make a couple points higher return or, uh, on the deal, which uh, is a win-win for everyone. You know, cover, it, it often can cover all of any, any management fees we take in the fund, which is also backloaded where we don't really get paid until after the investors already have all their money back. Right, so that's why the IRR is is, is higher uh, on this multifamily uh, project than, than the others. Uh, so we're, cause we're participating uh, as a GP, so. So why don't we talk a little bit about um, the JCAM funds expected return. Uh, we're targeting a 15% IRR, um, has a minimum of investment of 50,000 and our cash on cash, um, target is six to eight percent depending on which share class you're in um you know we've already talked about the assets um, that we're investing in so jack maybe you could talk a little bit about the the different share classes that we have to offer for our passive investors uh sure so i'll start with the fixed returns because that's pretty pretty simple uh, we have a share class that's a 10 percent return annually with a three-year lockup and uh, we do that to match with uh, some of the investments that are, you know, more like three year turns. Um, we also have a 12% fixed return class um, that has a, a shorter duration where uh, investors can, uh, you know, request to be redeemed. And uh, we, we generally use that as sort of a bridge where if we have an asset that's, uh, you know, we're going to close in the next 30 to 60 days, um, you know, it's a good way to raise, raise capital quickly for those who may not want to be in five to seven years that, uh, you know, just lets us, uh, you know, lock in good deals when we see them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the equity side is either a six or an eight percent preferred return. So, um, and anything over two hundred fifty thousand, we we pay an eight percent preferred return. Um, and anything from the the fifty to to two fifty gets a six percent preferred return. So, you know, on a hundred thousand investment, to use a round number, you get paid a minimum six thousand per year in preferred return. Um, and there's also a return of capital. So if in year three, we return half the money, you know, you're getting half your money returned, and then you'll you'll still get a 6% preferred return on your unreturned capital. And we're targeting a 15% plus overall uh, IRR uh, over roughly five years. Um, and that's net of all fees. Um, we're actually trending higher uh, with some of these uh, deals that are, you know, pushing a 20% plus return. So um, again, you know, these, a lot, you know, a lot, uh, you know, five years is, is a long way away, but uh, we're on, you know, already on track and uh, we are paying quarterly distributions. So, um, you know, the first distribution is going to be in April and, uh, you know, we'll be paying consistent cash flow over the course of the five years with uh, uh, profits. And then once we've returned all capital, so all the preferred return and 100% of investor capital, that's, that's when, that's the only time where we start getting paid. And that's a 70-30 profit split. 70 to the investors, 30% to uh, the fund as, uh, you know, just as uh, carried interest. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, uh, I think what's important to note there is is the JCAM fund uh, managers of the fund, Jack and I, you know, we don't really get compensated um, until we return capital, return preferred returns, um, and then we get a percentage of the profit split. So our interests are really uh, al aligned with um, performing, so. And I, I do wanna to add too that I, um, you know, I have, uh, I, I initially invested 200,000 as the fund opened, which is uh, a little less than 10% of the fund. I'm actually, 
um, re-upping and uh, I'll, I'm gonna end up having uh, close to seven figures of my own money in the fund yeah. uh, as well. And uh, a few of the other initial investors are, are very, very close partners uh, of mine. So uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of skin in the game. Yeah, great, perfect, Jack, thanks for sharing. So if you'd like to see more detailed info on the fund offering, you can go to jcaminvestments.com backslash offerings. Uh, and see more info there. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you can reach out to us directly with any questions, comments, or feedback uh, you may have. And again, thanks again for joining us. Have an excellent day, and we'll catch you all next time.